Hello again, this time from Southeastern <clears throat> Europe. I'm sorry, Southeastern Finland in Northern Europe where I will be vacationing until July the 22nd when I will start my one day return trip to Southeastern Asia in the Philippines. 105 years ago today, that is on June, June the 28th, 1914, two shots were fired, the first one of which <clears throat> was then the more damaging one politically, which triggered the already tense international situation in continental Europe and led <clears throat> to the outbreak of the First World War just uh, five weeks or so later. And this had to do with the assassination of the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Alongside him was riding in the same open car, open top car, and most cars at the time were open top cars because of the um, limited technology and also because of, well, possibly uh, the view that in case there were accidents, sudden accidents, it would be much easier for people to be got out of the car or to get out of the car themselves um, than out of the open car rather than out of the enclosed car. <coughs> Archduke Franz Ferdinand, ironically, was not on good terms <coughs> with his aged uncle, the Austro-Hungarian Emperor Franz Josef. They had character differences besides Franz Josef <coughs> had been greatly displeased by Franz Ferdinand's decision back in uh, June 1900 to marry um, an aristocrat, but a non-royal and non-imperial woman, uh, Countess uh, Sophie von Hotek or Sophie Hotkova of uh, at least partial Czech descent. Um, he had only allowed his nephew to marry uh, Countess Sophie on the condition that the marriage be morganatic. In other words, should they have children, none of those children would inherit the Austro Hungarian throne, and that was what happened well because of the assassination which took place over two years before the aged emperor finally died and that happened in um, November 1916. Franz Ferdinand never inherited the Austro-Hungarian throne in the first place. Austria-Hungary was a multinational empire and uh, held uneasily together by the army, uh, foreign policy, the emperor who was fairly popular throughout the empire, by the bureaucracy and by a rather restrictive and authoritarian political system. On the Austrian side, uh, the adult Austrian male citizens had received the right to vote back in 1907. On the Hungarian side only, the property-owning um, adult male Hungarian citizens could vote, uh, and the voting um, requirements were so restrictive that only a small minority of the Hungarian population could vote. One problem in this multi-ethnic empire was that one uh, portion of the empire's population, the Slavic one was growing quickly because of a clearly higher birth rate than for the Austrian speaking Germans, or I'm sorry, for the German speaking Austrians and the Hungarians, who were supposed to be the two founding nationalities of the empire. <clears throat> the Archduke considered federalizing the Austro Hungarian Empire and at the same time making it a more united empire by creating a third crown, in other words, by giving a measure of self-government, sufficiently wide measure of self-government to the Slavic 
nationalities in order to significantly weaken the so-called Greater Serbian Movement, which sought to establish a large uh, South Slavic uh, country carved out of the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire's eastern territories in the Balkan Peninsula of Southeastern Europe. And that was one of the main reasons why these conspirators, six of whom were in Sarajevo, uh, which is now the capital of Bosnia-Herzegovina, at the time of the assassination had chosen him as the target and not, for example, Emperor uh, Franz Josef. So <clears throat> their plan was to remove Franz Ferdinand and therefore make their movement even stronger. And they regarded the huge Russian empire, which was in conflict with Austria-Hungary as their deliverer or savior of sorts. 11 years earlier, in June 1903, although it, uh, the event was still called according to the Julian calendar, which in the 20th century was 13 days behind the Gregorian one, as the May coup. Um, the Serbian king and his wife had been assassinated. The Serbian king at the time, Milan, was more conciliatory towards Austria-Hungary, and had he lived in 1914, possibly Serbia would have taken much harsher measures against the pan-Serbian movement than then turned out to be the case. The Obrenovic dynasty was therefore deposed and was uh, replaced by the Karadjordjevic Karadjordj dynasty, um, whose first king in Serbia was Peter I. And the Karadjordjevic dynasty took a much more nationalist line and confrontational line in its relations uh, with Austria-Hungary. An issue of contention was indeed Bosnia-Herzegovina, which in 1908 had been annexed by Austria-Hungary. Already in 1878, Austria-Hungary had gained uh, like overlordship of that area, uh, which the weakening Ottoman Turkish Empire had been forced to effectively cede to it. But still, Bosnia-Herzegovina had retained a measure of self-government. Several of the conspirators were Bosnian Serbs, and all of them favored a greater Serbia or a kind of um, South Slavic state, um, which indeed did emerge after the First World War, originally called the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes, and since the 1929 royal coup by uh, Peter I's son and successor, Alexander I, it was called even officially the Kingdom of Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia, as we know, effectively broke apart <clears throat> already starting in 1991, when Slovenia was able to uh, break free from it. And then as a result of the brutal war between 1992 and 1995, Croatia and Bosnia-Herzegovina became uh, independent, although Bosnia-Herzegovina then uh, would suffer from the damages of that war for years afterwards. And it still has a curious political system <clears throat> with three presidents, one representing the Serbs, another one representing the Croats, and then the third one representing the Bosnian Muslims, who ironically are mostly ethnic Croats or Serbs. <laughs> And then as a result of the um, 1912 and 1913 Balkan Wars, the Turkey, Ottoman Turkish Empire lost almost all of its remaining Southeastern European territories. Bulgaria also suffered losses while Serbia was able to extend its territories by conquering um, or being awarded as a result of the war, Kosovo and Macedonia. <clears throat> and as a result of the military alliances, 
Austria-Hungary, Germany and Italy, where the so-called central powers, although as we know, Italy would leave the central powers attracted by the Entente powers, um, more favorable promises for territorial enlargement in 1915. <clears throat> and then the Entente powers originally included uh, France, Russia and Britain. And as a result of these military alliances, much of uh, continental Europe then uh, entered the Second World War by early August 1914. Especially crucial was the British government's and parliament's decision to declare war on Germany on August the 4th, 1914. The Austro-Hungarian Empire had been born out of the Ausgleich or Compromise of 1867, 19 years after the so-called crazy year of Europe, 1848, which saw several attempts at revolution, only <clears throat> a few or some of which were successful at the time, um, and which were directed against the conservative, authoritarian and autocratic regimes, which uh, still governed much of continental Europe at the time. According to the Ausgleich or Compromise, Austria and Hungary received internal self-government or autonomy. They only shared the same ruler who was called the emperor in Austria and the king in Hungary, the same foreign policy, the same army, of course, and the same currency. However, they had different legislatures, different governments, uh, different laws, different educational and to some extent, different political systems, especially starting in 1907 when <clears throat> Austria entered uh, in terms of its male, adult male citizens, a kind of electoral democracy, although the uh, governmental structure still remained rather oligarchic. And even different citizenships. So citizens of <clears throat> Austria-Hungary were specifically either citizens of Austria or citizens of Hungary. In addition to the German-speaking Austrians <clears throat> and Hungarians, there were many Slavic uh, people living within the empire's borders. For example, Poles, Czechs, Slovaks, Slovenes, Croats, Bosniaks, Serbs, <clears throat> and even some Macedonians and Montenegrins. In the southwest, there was a large Italian minority. In the southeast, there was a large Romanian minority. In addition, there were, for example, Jews and Romanis or Gypsies living inside the empire. June the 28th, 1914 <clears throat> was also the um, 525th anniversary of the Battle of Kosovo or Kosovo Polje, the field of blackbirds, although of course we should remember that back in 1389 the Gregorian calendar did not yet exist. Had it existed, <clears throat> then theoretically uh, the date would have been uh, July the 5th. And for the Serbian and especially pan-Serbian nationalists, this date was a significant one because a Serb then killed the um, Ottoman Sultan or Emperor, although if I remember correctly, even the Serbian King was killed uh, during the battle. And because of the uh, decision by Franz Ferdinand to visit um, Sarajevo on that day, he put himself and also his um, wife at a great risk for their lives. Also, he or his entourage had unwisely decided to publish beforehand the route uh, which they were going to take through Sarajevo, which of course uh, was very uh, good news for the six would-be assassins because they positioned themselves along the route. However, at first, things seemed to go awry because at least two of the assassins, would-be assassins, were too discouraged 
uh, to throw their bombs. <clears throat> One actually threw a bomb, it injured um, over 10 people, and the, he then uh, swallowed a cyanide pill which was supposed to kill him and jumped into the Milyatska River. However, the cyanide pill was too old uh, to cause any worse symptoms than vomiting. Besides, uh, due to the hot and dry early summer, the Milyatska River was only 10 centimeters deep. This would-be assassin was hauled out of the river and severely beaten and taken into police custody. And then um, there was a reception at the uh, city hall where the mayor started to speak and then uh, the archduke <clears throat> angrily interrupted him by saying, we come to uh, Sarajevo for a visit and have bombs thrown at us. It is outrageous. Then his wife was able to calm him, and then uh, the Archduke uh, let the mayor finish his speech, and the Archduke then, in his speech, thanked uh, those citizens of Sarajevo who had shown him sympathy. Then they left the city hall, and then their plan was to visit the hospital where some of the wounded had been taken after the first attempted assassination, and this decision basically sealed their fate because uh, their car's driver had not been informed of that. He only was informed at the last minute by uh, the um, military governor of Bosnia-Herzegovina, Mr. Oskar Potjohek. And then as he started to uh, reverse the car, uh, one of the assassins um, a former Bosnian Serb student who in 1912 had been expelled from his school for participating in the pan-Serbian movement. Mr. Gavrilo Princip saw his chance, stepped forward, and from a distance of about one and a half meters or five feet, he fired two shots, hitting the Archduke and the Duchess. Later, he said that he regretted hitting the Duchess and instead would have wanted to kill uh, Governor Potjohek. He was severely beaten and taken into custody. And then this plot began to unravel. Uh, for example, Mr. Princip was considered by the authorities as being too young to be sentenced to death. There were conflicting reports of his age. According to one account, he was about four weeks short of his 20th birthday. Another date placed his birth date a couple of days before the assassination. The judge decided this ambiguity in Mr. Princip's favor and uh, assumed that he had only been 19 years old when assassinating the Archduke and the Duchess and therefore sentenced him to 20 years imprisonment uh, with a one day fast per month. Uh, he was already suffering from tuberculosis, which ate up his bones so that one of his arms had to be amputated, and eventually he died of the disease in the spring of 1918, several months before the end of the First World War. But these trials would continue, and uh, would result in various convictions. The Sarajevo trial began in October 1914. They prosecuted the Sarajevo assassins except for uh, Mahmoud Mehmed Basic, who had escaped to Montenegro and was released from uh, police custody there to Serbia, together with the agents and peasants who had assisted them on their way. Most of the defendants were charged with conspiracy to commit high treason involving official circles in the Kingdom of Serbia. Conspiracy to commit high treason carried a maximum sentence of death, which conspiracy to commit simple murder did not. The trial was held from 
October the 12th to 23rd, with the verdict and sentences announced on October the 28th, 1914. So along with Mr. Princip, uh, Mr. Nedjelko or Nedjelko Chabrinovich, Mr. Trifon Grabež, and uh, Trifon Grabež were sentenced to 20 years imprisonment, which was the most severe penalty that could be given to underaged assassins under the Austro-Hungarian law. Underaged meaning under 20 year old assassins. Mr. Vasil Chubrilovich was sentenced to 16 years, Mr. Tsvetko Popovich to 13 years, Mr. Lazar Djukic to 10 years, <clears throat> then Mr. Danilo Ilic was executed by hanging in February 1915, as was Mr. Velko Chubrilovich. Uh, Nejo Cherkerovich was also sentenced to be uh, executed by hanging, but uh, the Austrian finance minister recommended uh, to the emperor Franz Josef uh, that he commute the sentence to 20 years in prison, and the aged emperor followed the finance minister's recommendation. Mr. Mikhailo Jovanovich was also executed by hanging in February 1915. Mr. Yakov Milovic uh, had his death sentence commuted to life in prison. Mr. Mitar Kerovich was also sentenced to life in prison. Mr. Ivo Krancevich was sentenced to 10 years in prison. Mr. Branko Zagorats and Marko Perin were sentenced to three years in prison. Mr. Tsvian uh, Stepanovich was sentenced to seven years uh, in prison, and nine def defendants were acquitted. At the trial, Mr. Chabrinovich expressed that he was sorry for the murders and received a letter of complete forgiveness from the three young children the assassins had orphaned. Mr. Chabrinovich, just like Mr. Princip, died of tuberculosis in prison. In the Salonika or Thessaloniki trial <clears throat> in the spring of 1917, The following sentences were handed. The mastermind of these operations, <coughs> Mr. Dragutin Dimitrievich, known as Apis, who was a high ranking Serbian military official and had organized back in 1913 uh, the coup that killed uh, King Alexander, sorry, not Milan, but Alexander and his wife, Draga Moshin. He was sentenced to death by firing squad and executed in June 1917. Mr. Yuba Vulovic was also executed on, uh, in June 1917 by firing squad, as was Mr. Rade Malobabic in June 1917. And then Mohammed Me Mehmed Basic was sentenced to 15 year imprisonment, uh, which was commuted to time served in 1919, uh, by which time the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes had been established, and he was released then. Following the assassinations, the Serbian ambassador to France, Mr. Milenko Vesnic, Vesnic and the Serbian ambassador to Russia, Mr. Miroslav Spalajkovic, put out statements claiming that Serbia had warned Austria-Hungary <clears throat> of the impending assassination. The Serbian Prime Minister Nikola Basic, um, however, claimed that he had not made warnings and denied even knowing of the plot. 
Other voices eventually spoke out on the warning. As Serbian education minister, Mr. Ljuba Jovanovic wrote in Krv Slovenstva in late May or early, that in late May or early June 1914, so just weeks before the assassination, Prime Minister Pasic had reviewed the plot of the impending assassination with members of his cabinet. On June the 18th, 1914, just 10 days before the assassinations, a telegram lacking in specifics ordered Serbia's ambassador to Austria-Hungary, Mr. Jovan Jovanovic, and to warn Austria-Hungary that Serbia had reason to believe there was a conspiracy to assassinate Franz Ferdinand in Bosnia. On June the 21st, Ambassador Jovanovic had met the Austro-Hungarian finance minister Bilinski. According to Serbian military attaché to Vienna, Colonel Lesanin, Ambassador Jovanovic had spoken to Bilinski and stressed in general terms the risks the Archduke and heir apparent might run from the inflamed public opinion in Bosnia and Serbia, that some serious personal misadventure might happen to him. Bilinski, however, did not take him seriously. He only said goodbye and thanked him. Let us hope nothing does happen. And then there were these uh, draconian conditions, the ultimatum imposed on Serbia. which was deliberately made so harsh that the Serbian government could not accept uh, all of its conditions without basically compromising on their countries or its country's independence. And following the answer, which tried to be conciliatory, but which fell short of the full acceptance of the conditions. Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia on July the 28th, 1914, but the first battles between the two countries only took place in early August 1914. So this was a part of the so-called July crisis. Already during the visit of uh, of um, the chef de cabinet, cabinet chief of the Austro-Hungarian foreign minister, Count Alexander von Hoyos to Berlin on July the 5th and 6th, uh, 1914. The German emperor Wilhelm or William II had at the same time concluded correctly that a war between Austria-Hungary and Serbia could result in a severe international crisis and had at the same time given a blank check, an unconditional promise of Germany's full support to Austria-Hungary should this kind of war break out. And this was probably then one of the reasons why uh, almost five years later at the uh, Treaty of Versailles, uh, from which, from whose signing 100 years have past today, uh, Germany was concluded as being supposedly the only country guilty of starting the 
First World War, which of course is not true because Austria-Hungary was at least as guilty of starting it due to its uh, excessive demands on Serbia. <clears throat> so let's try to find the ultimatum. <laughs> So the Austro-Hungarian ultimatum demanded that Serbia formally and publicly condemn the dangerous propaganda against Austria-Hungary, whose ultimate aim, uh, according to the ultimatum, was to detach from the monarchy, meaning from Austria-Hungary territories belong to it. Moreover, Serbia should have suppressed by any, every means this criminal and terrorist propaganda. In addition, Serbia was to suppress all publications which incited hatred and contempt of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy and were directed against its territorial integrity. It was to dissolve the Serbian nationalist organization Narodna Odbrana or the People's Defense and all other such societies in Serbia. It was to delete without delay from school books and public documents all propaganda against Austria-Hungary. It was to <clears throat> dismiss from the Serbia military and civil administration, all officers and functionaries whose names the Austro-Hungarian government would provide. It was to accept in Serbia representatives of the Austro-Hungarian government for the suppression of subversive movements. It was to brought, uh, bring to trial all accessories to the Archduke's assassination and allow Austro-Hungarian delegates or law enforcement officers to take part in the investigations. It was to arrest Major Vojislav Dankosic and civil servant Milan Tsiganovic, who were named as participants <clears throat> in the assassination plot. It was to seize the cooperation of the Serbian authorities in the traffic in arms and explosives across the frontier and dismiss and punish the officials of Shabats and Loznitsa frontier service because they were supposedly guilty of having assisted the perpetrators <clears throat> of this assassination. It was to provide explanations to the Austro-Hungarian government regarding Serbian officials who had expressed themselves in interviews uh, in a hostile manner towards the Austro-Hungarian government. <clears throat> it was also to notify the Austro-Hungarian Austro government <clears throat> without delay of the execution of the ultimatums measures. The Serbian government was <clears throat> given only 48 hours or two days to reply. <clears throat> Predictably, Serbia uh, accepted only some manners. Some historians argue that Serbia accepted all of the terms of the ultimatum except for the demanding point six that Austrian police be allowed to operate in Serbia. <clears throat> Others, especially Clark, argue the Serbs drafted their reply to the ultimatum in such a manner as to give the impression of making significant concessions, but in reality then this was a highly perfumed rejection on most points. <clears throat> In a letter to Venetia Stanley, the British Prime Minister and Liberal Party's leader at the time, Herbert Asquith, outlined the sequence of events that might lead to a general war. <clears throat> but noted unrealistically, as it turned out, that there was no reason for Britain to become involved. 
The first Lord of the Admiralty or effectively Navy Minister, Winston Churchill wrote, Europe is trembling on the verge of a general war. The Austrian ultimatum to Serbia being the most insolent document of its kind ever devised. However, <clears throat> he believed that Britain would stay neutral in the coming war. The British Foreign Secretary or Foreign Minister, Sir Edgar, Edward Gray, suggested to the Austrian ambassador that the deadline for the ultimatum be extended as the best way of saving the peace. Britain at the time was actually on the brink of civil war because of the uh, conflict between unionists and nationalists in Ireland. When Gray told his friend, <clears throat> the German ambassador to Britain, Mr. Uh, or pr uh, Prince Max von Lichnowsky, any nation that accepted conditions like that would really cease to count as an independent nation. Uh, the German Emperor Wilhelm or William II, known for his sharp-tongued rhetoric, which often scored, uh, caused diplomatic and other scandals, wrote on the margin of Lichnowsky's report, that would be very desirable, and claimed <clears throat> that Serbia was only a band of robbers. The Russian Foreign Minister, Mr. Sergei Sazonov, sent a message to all of the great powers asking them to pressure Austria to extend the ultimatum's deadline. He asked the Austrian government to back its claims of Serbian complicity in the killing of uh, Franz Ferdinand by releasing the results of its official inquiry, which the Austrians refused to do because they lacked any conclusive as opposed to circumstantial evidence. Several times the Austrians refused the Russian requests to extend the deadline despite warnings that an Austro-Serbian war could easily cause a world war. Sazonov then accused the Austrian ambassador of intending uh, to uh, drive the country to war with Serbia. <clears throat> On July the 23rd, um, 1914, the British Foreign Secretary Sir Edward Grey made a mediation offer with a promise <clears throat> that his government would attempt to influence Russia to influence Serbia and Germany to influence Austria-Hungary as the best way of stopping a general war. Wilhelm II uh, claimed that Britain's orders were condescending and Germany was to totally reject them and <clears throat> that Austria-Hungary would not uh, compromise on any of its impossible demands on Serbia. <clears throat> uh, and he continued, am I to do that? Wouldn't think of it. What does he or Gray mean by impossible? Germany, according to its uh, political and military leaders or political ones anyway, regarded the Austro-Serbian relations as an internal affair of Austria-Hungary in which the Germans had no standing to intervene. Starting on July the 23rd, 1914, all of Germany's leaders returned secretly to Berlin, the German capital, to deal with the crisis. A division between those led by the more moderate Reich Chancellor or Imperial Prime Minister, Mr. Bettmann uh, Holweg, who wanted to see what would happen uh, after Austria attacked Serbia. And the military led by um, Moltke and Falkenhayn, who urged that Germany immediately follow an Austrian attack on Serbia by attacking Russia, uh, which uh, Serbia regarded as an ally. Moltke uh, claimed, for example, that Russian mobilization was regarded as an opportunity to be sought rather than a sort of uh, threat, because it would allow Germany to go to war while presenting it as being forced on Germany. The German military attaché in Russia reported that Russian preparations for mobilization were on a much smaller scale <clears throat> than expected. Though he at first argued that Germany should wait for Russia to mobilize before beginning the preventive war, 
By the end of the week, he urged that Germany should launch it anyway. Uh, Germany, or I mean the German military and political authorities knew that despite being on paper the strongest military power in Europe, or actually in Eurasia, Russia was suffering from a shortage of trained officers and soldiers, also its uh, military equipment compared to the German one, especially in Europe, was outdated. Also, its uh, supply and railway networks were rather primitive compared to the German ones. And they correctly concluded that Russia uh, would actually um, be much easier to fight in, re in practice than on paper. And Russia did, in fact, end up losing uh, most of its Western territories to Germany by the time uh, the Bolshevik Revolution took place in November <clears throat> 1917. <clears throat> On July the 24th, 1914, the Serbian government, expecting an Austrian or Austro-Hungarian declaration of war, on July the 25th, mobilized while Austria-Hungary broke off diplomatic relations. The British ambassador to Austria-Hungary reported to London, war is fought imminent, wildest enthusiasm prevails in Vienna. On July the 25th, the Austro-Hungarian emperor Franz Josef signed a mobilization order for eight army corps to begin operations against Serbia on July the 28th. The Austro-Hungarian ambassador Giesel left Belgrade, the Serbian capital. The caretaker French government in Paris canceled all leave or holidays for French troops as of July the 26th and ordered the majority of French troops in Morocco <clears throat> in Northwestern Africa to begin returning to France. On July the 24th and 25th, the Russian Council of Ministers or the Imperial Cabinet met. The Russian Agriculture Minister Alexander Krivoshein, who was especially trusted by the Russian Emperor or Tsar Nikolai or Nicholas II, argued that Russia was not militarily ready for a conflict with Germany, Austria, Hungary. And that was actually true, as it turned out already in the first months of the year, Russia suffered <clears throat> humiliating defeats, starting from the first Battle of the Lakes of uh, Masuria in what is now northeastern Poland, where basically um, the second Russian army was destroyed. And rather than face a court, possible court martial, or at the very least demotion, the general who led that army committed suicide. <coughs> Minister Sazonov stated that Russia had usually been moderate in its foreign policy, but that Germany had viewed its moderation as a weakness to be taken advantage of. The Russian War Minister Vladimir Sukhomlinov and the Navy Minister Admiral Ivan Grigorovich stated that Russia <clears throat> was not ready for a war against either Austria or Germany, but that a firmer diplomatic stance was necessary. The Russian government again and futilely asked Austria to extend the deadline and advised <coughs> Serbia <coughs> to offer as little resistance as possible to the terms of the Austro-Hungarian ultimatum. <coughs> Finally, to deter Austria-Hungary from war, the Russian Council of Ministers ordered a partial mobilization against Austria. Despite the fact that Russia had no alliance with Serbia, the Council agreed to a secret partial mobilization of over one million men of the Russian army <clears throat> and the Baltic and Black Sea fleets. This was done before Serbia formally had rejected the ultimatum and before Austria-Hungary had formally declared war on uh, Serbia on July the 28th. 
<coughs> the Russian foreign minister Sergei Sazonov believed that war was inevitable and refused to acknowledge that Austria-Hungary had a right to countermeasures in the face of Serbian irredentism. Instead, he had aligned himself with irredentism and expected uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire's collapse, which happened, but also the Russian, <clears throat> German, and Ottoman Turkish empires collapsed as a result of the uh, First World War. On July the 25th, Foreign Secretary Gray suggested again that Germany inform Austria Hungary that the Serbian reply to the Austrian ultimatum was satisfactory. <clears throat> On July the 26th, 1914, Berchtold rejected Gray's mediation offer and wrote that, that if a localization should not prove possible, then the duo monarchy, meaning Austria-Hungary, was counting with gratitude on Germany's support if a struggle against another adversary would be forced on them. <coughs> on the same day, General von Moltke sent a message to Belgium demanding that German troops be allowed to pass through that kingdom in case Germany went to war against France and Russia. Uh, Reich Chancellor Bettmann Holbeck advised uh, Emperor or Kaiser Wilhelm II to send his cousin uh, Nicholas II a telegram, which he assured the emperor was for public relations purposes only. As uh, Reich Chancellor Bettmann Holbeck put it, if war should come after all, such a telegram would make Russia's guilt glaringly plain. Also on July the 26th, in St. Petersburg, the Russian imperial capital, the German ambassador von uh, Purtales told uh, Foreign Minister Sazonov to reject Gray's offer of a summit in London, stating that <clears throat> the proposed confidence conference was too unwieldy, and if Russia were serious about saving the peace, they would negotiate directly with the Austrians. Sazonov replied, that he was willing to see Serbia accept almost all of the Austro-Hungarian demands and rejected Gray's conference proposal in favor of direct talks with the Austro-Hungarians. On July the 27th, Foreign Secretary Gray sent another peace proposal through Prince Lishnovsky, the German ambassador to Britain at the time, asking for Germany to use its influence on Austria-Hungary to save the peace. Foreign Secretary Gray warned Ambassador Lishnovsky that if Austria-Hungary continued with its aggression against Serbia and Germany with its policy of supporting Austria-Hungary, then Britain would have to side with France and Russia. The French Foreign Minister informed the German ambassador in Paris, von Schoen, that France was anxious to find a peaceful solution and was prepared to do his utmost with his influence in St. Petersburg if Germany should counsel moderation in Vienna, <clears throat> since Serbia had fulfilled nearly every point. <clears throat> On July the 28th, after reading Serbia's reply, Emperor Wilhelm or William II commented, but that eliminates any reason for war or every cause for war falls to the ground. Uh, Emperor William noted, that Serbia had made a capitulation of the most humiliating kind. His sudden change of mind about war enraged uh, Reich Chancellor Betman Hoveg, the military and the diplomatic service who proceeded to sabotage uh, William's offer. Then, Also on July the 28th at 11.49 a.m., Prince Lishnovsky sent the fourth British offer of mediation, this time from King George V, who was also related uh, to Emperor William II and the Russian Emperor Nicholas II, as well as Grey. 
Vishnovsky wrote that the king desired that British-German joint participation with the assistance of France and Italy may be successful in mastering in the interest of peace, the present extremely serious situation. <coughs> and then on the same day, July the 28th at 11 uh, o'clock a.m. sharp, Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia. On July the 29th, William II sent a telegram uh, to his cousin, Nicholas II, stating, I think a direct understanding between your government and Vienna possible and desirable. On the same day, Foreign Secretary Gray warned Prince Lichnowsky in veiled terms that if Germany attacked France, then Britain would consider going to war with Germany. Gray he repeated his stop in Belgrade peace plan and strongly urged Germany to accept it. He ended his meeting with a warning that unless Austria is willing to enter upon a discussion of the Serbian question, a world war is inevitable. <clears throat> Between July the 28th and 30th, 1914, Germany urged Austria-Hungary to accept the Serbian offer, but without success. On July the 30th, 1914, Nicholas II sent a message to uh, William II informing him that he had ordered partial mobilization against Austria-Hungary and asked him to do his utmost for a peaceful solution. Upon hearing of Russia's partial mobilization, William wrote, then I must mobilize too. The German ambassador in St. Petersburg informed Nicholas that Germany would mobilize if Russia did not seize all military preparations at once, including those it had previously assured <clears throat> Russia it did not see as a threat against Germany or calls for German mobilization. <coughs> Nicholas II wanted neither to abandon Serbia to the ultimatum of Austria-Hungary, nor to provoke a general war. In a series of letters exchanged with his cousin and, as it turned out, enemy, William II, the so-called Willie and Nikki correspondence, because they preferred to write to each other in English and then <coughs> call themselves by nicknames. Uh, the two emperors claimed that they wanted peace, and each attempted to get the other to back down. Nicholas desired that Russia's mobilization be only against the Austro-Hungarian border in the hopes of preventing war with the German Empire. But since his army had no contingency plans for partial mobilization, <clears throat> on July the 31st, 1914, Nicholas II took the fateful step of conforming, confirming the order for general mobilization despite being strongly counseled against it. So let's look at Willie and Nikki correspondence. <clears throat> So there were 10 messages wired between them <clears throat> starting on July the 29th and concluding on August the 1st, 1914. Their source is the German White Book, a pamphlet of official documents published to justify the German government's position after the outbreak of war, which of course should lead any serious <clears throat> teacher, researcher, or student of history, including myself, um, to view these telegrams with a degree of caution, because of course, as historians and or researchers of history, teachers of history, and even students and readers of history, we should cast a critical eye on such sources, and generally speaking, on all sources, in the sense that we de um, 
retain a healthy degree of a critical approach to sources. For example, who produced these sources, under what uh, conditions, for what uh, purposes, and with what effects, for example. And then <clears throat> compare critically those sources. <clears throat> The term Williniki telegrams is derived from the Williniki correspondence, the title of a book by uh, Hermann Bernstein, published in 1918, which revealed the personal telegraphic correspondence between the two emperors during the period from June 1904 to August <clears throat> 1907. The telegram started with a plea from the Tsar or Russian emperor to the Kaiser or German emperor to try to stop the series developments that led up to the <clears throat> First World War. An excerpt from July the 29th, 1914, 1 a.m. Okay. <clears throat> I foresee that very soon I shall be overwhelmed by the pressure forced upon me and be forced to take extreme measures which will lead to war. To try and avoid such a calamity as a European war, I beg you, in the name of our old friendship, to do what you can <clears throat> to stop our allies from going too far. Nikki. Ultimately, the correspondence changed tone, and the two leaders warned each other of impending mobilization <clears throat> due to factors out of their control, while retaining <coughs> the notion that mobilization did not mean war. An excerpt of the last telegram sent by uh, Wilhelm or William II on August the 1st, 1914. Immediate, affirmative, clear and unmistakable answer from your government is the only way to avoid endless misery. Until I have received this answer, alas, I am unable to discuss the subject of your telegram. As a matter of fact, I must request you to immediately order your troops on no account to commit the slightest act of trespassing over our frontiers, Willie. Okay. Austria-Hungary pursued the Serbian war. France and Britain still urged restraint on July the 30th and 31st. Germany then mobilized between August the 1st and 3rd, <clears throat> 1914. And then on August the 2nd, entered Luxembourg and Belgium. And... Uh, the entry to Belgium was the last straw for Britain, which back in 1839 had concluded a treaty um, in which it had promised to guarantee Belgium's neutrality. And since Germany refused to respect this treaty, effective on August the 4th, 1914, the British Empire declared war on Germany. The German Reich Chancellor or Imperial Prime Minister Bettmann Hallweg dismissed the treaty as just a scrap of paper. <clears throat> Germany proceeded to declare war on Russia, France, and Belgium between August the 1st and 4th, 1914. And thus the world, Europe, and with it the world was plunged into the First World War.